Understanding the formation of, of stars and planets is, is exciting because it basically is understanding our origins. Where do we come from? Um, where does the material in the solar system come from? Why is there water on Earth? Why is there life on Earth? Well, these are the sort of questions that we can answer with meteorites. And I think that's fascinating because it, it touches our, our, our soul. I mean, where does life come from? Can life exist in other places? And I think these are questions which are really, really exciting. My name is uh, Martin Bizarro, so I'm a professor at the University of Copenhagen and uh, I work in the field of meteoritics. Uh, meteorites are samples of different planets or different parts of the solar system and they carry a lot of information. Some of them have been unmodified basically since their formation, so they hold clues to the very, very first history of our solar system. Um, other meteorites are younger, they can come from planets, for example Mars, and they provide us with another kind of information. The majority of meteorites that we have in our collection actually do come from the asteroid belt. So the asteroid belt is a region in space between Mars uh, and Jupiter. And when you think about the asteroid belt, people always think that it's crowded with material, just like you can see in movies in Star Wars, for example, when people are flying through the asteroid belt. But that's not reality. The reality is that there's very little mass in the asteroid belt. So imagine that uh, you're in the asteroid belt and there's a collision between two asteroids. A fragment is expelled and this basically drifts and is in a coarse collision with Earth, for example. So this is a meteoroid that's going to basically hit the Earth. Once it enters the atmosphere, it lights up, it becomes a fireball and then starts disintegrating slowly. It could also be a fragment of a planet. For example, if an asteroid hits the surface of Mars, it can make a piece of the crust of Mars eject and come to Earth. And the same, same thing on the Moon. Uh, you can have an impact and this material can come and reach the Earth. If we want to study the formation of a planet, then uh, we want to look at objects which come from planetary bodies because they record processes uh, which are involved in the evolution of a planet. For example, if you think of Mars, and if we have an, a fragment of the surface of Mars which dates back to the earliest um, epoch of the planet, then we can say how fast and, and or how slow was the planet basically built up. And these information can be used to, uh, to speak towards the various models that uh, are uh, currently on, under evaluation to understand how planets form. So do planets form very fast or very slowly? So if planets form very fast, that has one implication for, the, uh, for example, the origin of water. If it forms slowly, it has another implication. So by looking at meteorites which come from the surface or the crust of planets, we can speak towards the various modes of, of formation of these bodies. When we study meteorites, obviously um, we can't just look at them. We have to extract the information. So what we're doing here, we're cutting uh, very thin slices, a few millimeter of this chondrite here and the wire that you see goes back and forth. Uh, it's a wire that's coated with diamonds and because of that it can cut through this, this meteorite. And with these slices now we'll be able to extract the various components and study them. One of the research theme we've been uh, evaluating in the last couple of years is actually focused on the uh, potential early habitability of Mars. So we've been looking at a very special meteorite called Black Beauty, which is a fragment of the southern hemisphere of Mars. And that is exciting because most of the meteorites that we have to date from this planet come from the northern hemisphere, and that's a relatively younger part of the planet. 
So for the first time we had access to the primordial crust and that's very exciting because Mars being a planet without plate tectonics, uh, it means that the crust is the original crust and dates back to the very, very beginning. The problem with the Black Beauty meteorite is uh, that it's worth approximately 10,000 US dollars per gram. And so in order to study this meteorite, uh, you need to have significant amount of material and that is very, very costly. And so as it is now, we have basically the largest um, uh, allocated material to do research on, on Black Beauty. And that has led to important discoveries. So when we investigated Black Beauty Meteorite, we had a number of, of different scientific questions uh, to answer. And these questions require different approaches, different techniques, and, and, and different instrumentation. Okay, so now we're going to enter is into what is called a sample preparation lab. And in that lab, basically, we prepare all the samples to be ready for further analysis. So this is the first step uh, examination of the various types of meteorite. When we looked uh, earlier at the big saw uh, cutting a piece of a meteorite, this is actually the end product. Now we have a slice. So this is about a few millimeter. And you can see from that slice that we have these uh, circular objects. These are, are the so-called chondrules, which are the precursor material to planet. And here you can see the holes. Uh, that's because we've actually extracted those chondrules. And you can see we used this little saw here uh, basically to, to go around the, con the object and extract it. And you can see um, here that there's a little uh, uh, indentation here. And that's where the saw came in and then around that object and we took it out. So this is what it looked like before and now it's basically just the hole with the chondral that is missing. Part of the operation here when we study meteorites is that we have to extract various elements from the rock. So the meteorite has to be crushed, dissolved, and then we have to devise different chemical uh, procedure to say extract an element like uranium, lead, or magnesium or calcium. And these elements, we determine their isotopic composition and that tells us about a process or an age. And so this lab, uh, because contamination is, is, is always present uh, in the form of, of dust particles, for example, this, this lab is a dust-free lab. Uh, the only dust that, that, that is in the lab is the one you bring in. That's why we have gloves and, and we have these jackets. But uh, here we have fresh, uh, very uh, pure air, so filtered air, which is pushed down here. It's coming here. So all this environment here is ultra clean, uh, and that's why we work in these hoods here to minimize the amount of, of, of non-extraterrestrial material uh, uh, that could, could contaminate our samples. In uh, our research on Mars, in the last year, we've actually discovered a number of minerals which we believe originate from the inner part of the planet. So these minerals were present in this Black Beauty meteorite and they have an isotopic composition and an age which suggests that they come from a giant volcanic field on, on Mars, so the Olympus Mons. Um, in one of these uh, crystals, these, we found some minor inclusions of the mineral apatite. And that's exciting because um, apatite uh, naturally contains water in its structure. And so by measuring the isotopic composition of hydrogen, for example, in this apatite, we can compare the 
water on Mars with the water on Earth. And so when we make those measurements in the coming months, we'll be able to determine whether Mars and Earth have the same source of water. And if they do have the same source of water, then it probably means that water was present in the inner solar system from the beginning. Because it'd be very unlikely that two plant planets receive a late delivery of water by impact and that this water has the same composition because we know that the ices in the outer solar system are extremely uh, heterogeneous in terms of hydrogen isotopes. If the, um, the hypothesis that the water was present from the beginning uh, rather than, than being delivered late and required some sort of uh, chance event, um, that has fundamental implication for habitability, uh, not in, only in our solar system, but in other places in the galaxy. Because if, if the presence of water in, in, in planetary bodies is a predictable outcome of the growth of the bodies, it means that water should be everywhere. There should be water worlds everywhere in the galaxy. It basically highlights that, that there could be other planets in the galaxy which are habitable. And that makes me think that, that the initial conditions uh, in the formation of a planetary, planetary body might be very important in determining whether a planet ends up being habitable or not. And I'll give you an example. Think about Venus and Earth. Uh, Venus is, uh, and Earth are basically um, compositional twins. They have a, about the same size, the same composition, the same density, um, about the same distance from the Sun, yet Venus is, is, is a hellish world, I mean a very hot volcanic planet, and life flourishes on Earth. So why is it that there's, there's um, although these planets are very similar, they're drastically different in terms of their potential habitability. And so for me that, that speaks towards that the initial conditions, subtle changes in the initial conditions during plant formation may result in a planet that is habitable or a planet that is very hostile to life. And so I want to understand how these initial conditions basically modulate the potential habitability of planets and then apply this knowledge to predict where in the galaxy uh, habitable planets might be located.